Spikes were used by messengers a long, long time ago. Pate fixed up three bikes instead of one. You can see in these letters that the outside world has extremes of beauty and tragedy beyond anything I've known. They were right. The letter never made it. The season before this one, the war, seems so horrible. That poor baby. Before setting up in Karo village, Dr. Fumio roamed the land curing people. It must have been hard when he wasn't around anymore, especially for people who couldn't travel to the village. Traders used to come to the outskirts of the village. The war put an end to this.
I feel nourished in these sights by the unfamiliarity of it all. These means of connection, long in disuse, are certainly telling me something about the world. Will they be used again in the next season? Crane to move materials around. The things that used to be possible. first time petting an animal. I think it went pretty well. Mm, that time it felt off. I guess I had beginner's luck before. Okay, now I got it back. I'm in control. I can easily pet certain four-legged animals.
I cycled through landscapes, seeing them for the first and last time. I had no idea when I left my home how the season would end, or more importantly, how soon. On a cold, damp day, I feel true loneliness for the first time. Nobody could have described with words how big this world is, how it goes and goes. I passed through it, where others passed before me. This person wanted the season to change. Why? They wanted the season to change because they were so alone. Time seems to pass differently around here. I feel so heavy and so light at the same time. I'm not really alone. I'm with myself. I'm with the earth.
one melody is like me out here alone. I can't really live like this. They kept themselves company with music. Two voices is like me and my mom. We can survive, but eventually you need more. Three voices as complex as life is supposed to be. I could listen forever. Looks like they made it out of here. But what is this group? In the empty places, I found companionship in the tapes I recorded before leaving home. The elder told me the story of her life. I listened back to it, ready to note down anything that seemed important. Let's set the scene for the listener, whoever that might be. This is the elder speaking. We're sitting in the plaza, saying goodbye to a dear soul. We're here to see if there's anything useful in my mind that could help you on your trip. A century's worth of memories, dreams, fantasies, visions, like a big old haunted library. When I die, this library will burn down. But which book should we check out first? I don't have all the answers, but I do feel the story of my life could help you understand what kind of world is out there. It's okay not to understand everything right away. The moment may pass before you've gotten a firm hold on it. But as long as you're there to witness it, to take it down in your journal, you and others to come will someday take the time to make sense of it all. I heard, somebody told me, you want to capture what it's like to be alive during this season, for the future, and you want to understand why and how the season is going to end. The season of my youth is long gone, but I can tell you what that season was like and what I know about how it ended. Francis Kale, if you must know, you can call me Frank, or Elder, or the Elder, or Elder Frank. You know, whatever, I don't care. I was born on the ocean. My mother and father worked on a cruise ship, a short-lived but glorious, watery republics, floating cities. Most won their independence by the time I was born. How can I describe them? They were a jewel of the golden season, pleasure boats with a radical political program. How nice. The golden age was a time of flags, logos, mottos, mastheads. My mom taught me to read them. She was a ship's philosopher. My dad was a recycling engineer. Recycling on the ship was a matter of life and death. We had to get the most out of every object and watt of energy.
My grandparents played with the past. They changed it like we change our wardrobe. So it was a different answer every time. But they often said we are exiles of some kind, exiled royalty from a secret lineage, blood that glows in the dark, or we're exiled from the mouth of some great leviathan. When they were older, they just said, we're from here, we're from right now. I loved the way the ship would tilt and roll with the waves, especially as I fell asleep. It was so comforting. Picture me as a kid in bed, feeling the swaying of the ship. It was like being rocked to sleep as a baby. I loved exploring the ship too, wandering through the suites, the swimming pool, the game rooms, and oh, there were two dance halls, a large, elegant one and another one in the basement. A lot of my firsts were down there, my first dance, my first kiss, and so forth. Our ship was taken over in the early days of the war. That was the end of the watery republics. I heard the dance hall in the basement became a weapons cache. It took me half my life to say goodbye to the world I knew in my youth. Imagine me and my parents and everyone I knew being escorted off the ship by a company of soldiers. And I'm thinking, I hope they don't make a mess of my room. I was embarrassed by the younger kids who were crying their eyes out, but they knew, I guess. Yes, the start of the war was a turning of seasons, and we had been warned the season was going to end. Oh, but we didn't understand the warning. You see, one night, along a coastline, we saw beautiful lights shimmering above the water. Later, we found out this was an ancient warning system. It hadn't been used in so long. We didn't know what it meant. We just thought, well, ain't that pretty. We tried to stick together and camped out on the coast of the prismatic grounds. A kingdom of art and science. They got rich during the golden season. Everything that made them beloved before the wealth came. Passionate uncompromising, self-obsessed, made them unbearable once they had power. Artists make terrible kings. Are you sure you want me to keep going? The story gets darker from here on. Okay, so conditions in the camp were getting worse. My mom got lost in thought for long periods of time. She'd be completely still for hours, days even. We realized she caught, well, now we call it time misperception disorder. It's when you lose your ability to tell how much time is passing. A minute can feel like an hour. A day can pass in 10 seconds. We don't know exactly. Our consciousness is delicate. There are minerals and sounds that can adjust it. Dr. Fumio's greatest fear was that someone would use this as a weapon. We heard about a traveling doctor who could cure these kinds of diseases. I decided to go find him. I found out his name was Dr. Fumio, and he traveled with his son, Lucio. People talked about him like he was a god. I described my mom's condition to Dr. Fumio. He said there was no cure yet, but there was a village high in the mountains. He thought it was high enough he'd have a better chance at treatment. Lower places are more dangerous. Valleys are the worst. He invited me to join them in going to the village but I wanted to go back and get my parents and bring them with me. I packed my things and got ready to leave the next morning. That night, my mom came to me in a dream. She was standing in a field of flowers. I'd grown since I last saw her. We were the same height. She pressed a finger hard into my palm. She taught me well. I knew the meaning of the gesture. I knew no matter what I did, I'd never see my parents again. In the morning, I told Dr. Fumio I would follow him to Carol Village. The next few weeks were very physically tiring, hiking, climbing. And when we found the village, building, planting, cleaning, Fumio brought sick people from all over the world, and they got better. The treatments worked. Everyone was healing. So why couldn't I? One day, we got word the war was over. We never found out how it ended. It was like peace just swept over the earth in a split second. There was a party in the plaza to celebrate the end of the war, but I couldn't bring myself to go. Yes, it was over, but it had taken my home, my family. That night, as I was falling asleep, I felt the bed tilt and sway gently, 
as if it was being tossed on the waves of the ocean, as if I was back in my bedroom on the ship, as if I was back in my mother's arms, being rocked gently to sleep. I knew I was finally home, and nothing could hurt me. I imagine coming upon a place as hidden and singular as my own village. Eventually, I found myself circling a valley, looking for a way in. <laughs> 